If you have your Bibles, open them with me to the book of Luke chapter 15. I want to just give a shout out really quick to all of those of you that uh, were here the last couple of days, all of those of you that were working, the choir, the worship team. I was watching the, I was watching the choir and the worship team this morning dancing and, and singing with all of their energy, and I thought, man, they are troopers. After, after last night and the night before, to be here early this morning and in the second service again with all of that energy, so amazing. Can we just put our hands together for the incredible worship team and choir and technicians and set up and tear down crew and the children's workers and everybody that's worked so hard to make this possible. It is Father's Day and I'm going to preach uh, a message this morning that is actually a Father's Day message even though it's known as the story of the prodigal son. But how many of you know the story of the prodigal son isn't really about the son, the story is about the father. And I'm going to use as an illustration here this incredible painting that was painted by a very famous artist by the name of Rembrandt. Anybody ever heard of this obscure person? One of the, one of the most famous, most talented um, artists that's ever lived. And according to some historians, like for example, Kenneth Clark, who was a famous art historian, he believed that this was not only the greatest painting of Rembrandt's, he believed that this painting, which is known as The Return of the Prodigal Son, he said it was the greatest painting ever painted. Okay, so we're talking this morning about a story told by Jesus, who was the greatest teacher that ever lived. And it's one of the teachings of Jesus that has become most famous of his. In fact, it is, a, it is sort of part of the canon of Western civilization. So one of the greatest stories ever told by the greatest storyteller that ever lived. And this is one of the greatest paintings ever painted by one of the greatest artists that ever lived depicting this story. How many of you would say this is something that might be worth talking about? And so we, we pick up the story of the prodigal son in the 15th chapter of the book of Luke. And I'm going to read it in sort of little chunks and then take a moment in between to talk about what's happening there. Because it, it is such a, a fascinating passage that I, I literally could probably spend uh, the next year doing a series just on this one story. But I'm going to try not to do that this morning. We'll try to get it all in one message. Amen. Luke chapter 15, verse 11 Jesus continued. He's about to tell the story now. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had and set off for a distant country. And there he squandered his wealth in wild living. Let me just talk about this for a moment because I think it's very important, especially, you know, a modern context that we understand what's going on here. In those days, of course, it was very common that a father would give his inheritance to his children after death. That's very similar to the way it is today. But I think in those days, there was a much more developed sense of how much each child would get. For example, the oldest son usually got the double portion of the inheritance. That, by the way, that's where the idea of the double portion comes from. And then the rest of it would be divided up amongst the other siblings. And so this usually would happen after the death of the parents. But in this case, the story that Jesus tells, something very unusual happens. This younger son of the fathers, there's only two that we know of, he comes to the father and he says, Dad, I want my share of the inheritance now. I don't want to wait until I'm old and gray and I can't enjoy it anymore. I want you to sell whatever you've got to sell, liquidate whatever assets you need to liquidate, and give me the portion of the inheritance that belongs to me today. And so for some reason, the Bible doesn't really say why, the father complied with this unusual request. He found the portion of the inheritance that belonged to that younger son. He gave it to him, and he gave it to him trusting him. How many of you know God is very trusting with us? Very often he puts resources into our hands and he doesn't tell us what to do with them. He trusts us to invest them wisely. So what did this young man do with the inheritance that was given to him? He didn't go buy a piece of property. He didn't invest it in you know, some business. He didn't give it to the poor. The Bible says that he took that portion of his, 
money, and he set off for a distant country where he squandered his wealth in wild living. I love how the Bible is so concise and, and you know, it has such an economy of words there. It doesn't really tell us what he did with his money, but it says that he wasted it on wild living. And your your imagination can run wild there to imagine all the things he must have done with that money in a distant country. Remember, we're talking about a Jewish boy here. This is a story of a Jewish family. And so when it says that he went into a distant country, what it's saying is that he took that money and he went to the land of the Gentiles. This was outside of Israel now. And not only was he in a heathen land, but now he was spending his money on ungodly things, wild living wasteful living he was living for the moment he was living for instant gratification he was living for pleasure it reminds me of a, a quote from I don't know if, it, know if I even want to say it because I don't want you to go watch it the Fast and Furious movie there's a <laughs> lead character stop it Levi He's a street racer, and his quote is, I live my life one quarter mile at a time. For two seconds or less, I'm free. It's this mentality that I'm gonna live my life in such a way that I get these bursts of adrenaline and excitement, and anything else that happens doesn't matter. It's just about those moments of exhilaration. How many of you know somebody who lives like this? How many of you live like this? Don't raise your hand. Actually, I think that you'd be surprised how many of us are actually living, even if we're not street racers, for these moments of gratification that happen in the moment without really thinking about the consequences of those actions and without really thinking about what impact our lives are making in the context of the kingdom of God and the world in history. We're just living for these moments of pleasure. Maybe it's not even bad things. Maybe it's just you're living for the next meal. Maybe it's you're living for the next party. Maybe it's you're living for the next toy that you can buy. It's a car or a jet ski or something that's gonna make you happy. My friend, can I tell you, if you're living that way, you are on a road that leads to frustration in the end and a life that feels futile and worthless and empty. And this is the way that this young man was living. He, he took the money that he could have spent wisely and he went to a foreign land and began to waste it on wild living. The King James says riotous living. And nothing else mattered to him for this season of his life. His family didn't matter. His reputation didn't matter. His future didn't matter. The impact that he would make on the world or how he would influence people around him, none of it mattered. He just wanted that high. He wanted that thrill. And the Bible says here in verse 14 that after he had spent everything. How many of you know there is always an after to whatever you're doing? This is the part we forget that there is coming an after in which you are going to have to give an account for the way that you live today. And after he had spent all of his money, it says there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods from the pigs that they were eating, but no one gave him anything. I want you to see, again, the story that Jesus is telling. He's painting this ever downward spiral that this young man is on. He takes the money, he goes to a foreign land, he wastes everything on wild living, and then at the end, here's what happens. You know, you know what happens after all your money is gone? The next step, all your friends are gone. So now he has no money, he has no friends, and just when you think it can't get any worse, a famine breaks out in the land. And so imagine, people are starving all around him. People are in need and in want all around him. And there was nothing he could do to help. He couldn't even help himself because he had nothing left. So the Bible says that he began to be in need. Isn't it interesting that if you think about what was happening here, obviously this young man had some need, some 
gaping hole in his heart that he was trying to fill. He was trying to satisfy something inside of him. That's why he went to this foreign land with his money and began to waste it on wild living. He was trying to satisfy something that he couldn't satisfy. But here's the irony. The more money he spent, the more desperate he became. The more he attempted to gratify himself, the more his desperation grew. It was almost as though the problem he was trying to solve was getting worse as he tried to solve it by the very means he was using to solve it. And this is exactly the way that it very often happens to us every single day in the world. Anyone who's come out of the world, you know, I, many of you have never heard my testimony. I lived a really rough life. I was a horrible sinner. I was a rebel against God. I was disrespectful. I was wicked until I met the Lord at seven years old and then everything changed <laughs> and transformed my life. I, I, don't, I don't have one of the testimonies like so many people that stand behind this pulpit. But that doesn't mean that I don't understand how this works. And it doesn't mean that I haven't seen many people and I've, I've witnessed to people and I've tried to disciple people who have run their lives into the ground seeking after pleasures that would never satisfy them. I, I've tried to help people that were drug addicts that literally killed themselves to get that next high. I've seen people who are willing to give up their families. They're willing to let their their lives fall apart just to have one more moment of gratification. Can I tell you, sin is deceptive and it is always a mistake and it always leads to death. The wages of sin, the Bible says, is death. I don't care how good it feels in the moment, it always leads to destruction. And so the, the Bible says that at some point now, not only is this young man in need, but he hires himself out to a citizen of that country. And it's another way of saying he becomes the employee of a Gentile. Now remember, from the perspective of a Jew listening to this story, we're talking about one of the people who was set apart among all the people of the world to be one of God's chosen people. This was a Jewish boy. And now he has gone to a foreign land, to a Gentile land. He has wasted everything. He has destroyed his life. He has become an employee of those heathens. And now his job is working in a pig pen. Now, if you know anything about Judaism, you know that for a Jew, the ultimate unclean animal is a pig. Jews don't eat pork. They don't touch pork, they don't go around pork, they want nothing to do with pigs. But here this young man is, not only is he taking care of the pigs, he's actually living with the pigs in the pig pen, longing, it says, to fill his stomach with the food that the pigs are eating. This is Jesus' way of saying, this guy has hit absolute rock bottom. You can't get any lower than this. He has lost everything financially. He's lost everything morally. He's lost everything culturally. He's lost everything relationally. He's lost everything spiritually. He is in the absolute lowest place that a human being can go. And in that place, something amazing happens. And I mention this because there might be some of you that are in that place right now this morning. What do you do when you hit rock bottom? Well, it says here, in verse 17, when he came to his senses. Can I tell you something? If you are living in sin, you are insane. You are out of your mind. I, I know the world tells you that this is totally normal. The world tells you don't worry about it. Yeah, you're hooked on drugs. Don't worry about it. That's a cool thing to do. Yeah, you're an alcoholic. That's fine. Yeah, you're cheating on your spouse. That's no big deal. Yeah, you're, you're involved in all kinds of dishonesty and immorality and you're watching pornography and you're involved in this and that and the world tells you you're fine. I'm here to tell you you're out of your mind. And it's time for you to come to your senses. And that's what the Holy Spirit does even in a morning like this is the Bible says that the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. He comes to you and he lifts the veil off of your eyes even if it's only for a moment so you can look back upon your life and realize that all those things you're living for are useless in the end. It's a moment of clarity that every person needs. It says that when he came to his senses, he said to himself, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare and here I am starving to death. 
I will send out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. He came to his senses. Anyone who has come out of the world, anyone who's gotten saved, anyone whose life has been transformed had a moment of clarity. I remember when I was 12 years old, I told you I got saved at seven, but you know, I, had, I still had things the Lord had to work on me with, right? Even today, believe it or not, the Lord's still working on me. Anybody there? So I was, I was like 12 years old and my cousin came to school one day and he opens up his backpack and inside there was a little pack of cigarettes. I'd never seen cigarettes up close before. I'd only seen them in like movies and stuff. So then my cousin pulls one of these things out, you know, and he holds it just so cool and he lights it. He's got his collar turned up like Jean, James Dean and a rebel without the cause. His leather jacket, kind of his foot back against the wall. I'm like, man, this guy's cool. I said, hey, can I have one of those? And to my amazement, he not only gave me a cigarette, he gave me a whole pack of cigarettes. So now I thought, I get to be one of the cool kids. But here's the problem. If my dad caught me smoking cigarettes, he would kill me, and that would be kind compared to what my mother would do. So, so I, I wanted to smoke the cigarettes, but I couldn't do it around any people. Because by the way, I lived in a town where everybody knew who Kalendas were. Isn't that right, Russ? So nobody could see this. So I went out into the woods, and I went to the most remote place that I could find in the woods, and then just to make sure, I went behind a big tree and sat down on the ground where I was sure nobody could ever see me. And I pulled out one of those cigarettes and lit it, and then I started smoking it. And if you, I'm sure you all can imagine the scene. I'm hacking and coughing, <laughs> and my head is hurting, and I feel like nauseous. But I'm determined that I'm gonna smoke that cigarette. I'm gonna get through it by hell or high water. And not only that, I'm gonna enjoy it and I'm gonna be cool in the process. And then suddenly I have this moment of clarity. I thought to myself, and remember I was only 12 so my brain was very undeveloped, but yet I had this thought, to my, I thought to myself, why am I doing this? And my response to myself was, you're doing this to be cool. And then I replied to myself, but if no one can see me, I'm hiding in the woods behind a tree. How cool am I exactly? So no one sees me, I'm not cool, I'm coughing, I'm nauseous. Why am I doing this? I took that pack of cigarettes, I threw it in the woods and I'm happy to report to you from that day on I've never smoked another cigarette. But this is not really about cigarettes, it's about that moment of clarity. It's about that moment where you wake up and you look at your life and you say, why am I doing this? Wake up. The thing that you're, that you're pursuing, that you're seeking, it's not making you happy. And do you know why I know it's not making you happy? Because you keep searching and you keep longing. If it was satisfying you, you'd be satisfied, but you're not. The more you seek, the more hungry you become. Can I tell you, you need to seek for something else. You need to find something that satisfies you. Say amen. And so he said to himself, here's what I'm gonna do. Just like I had a conversation with myself behind that tree in the woods. This young man is talking to himself and he says to himself, how many of my father's servants are eating better than this? Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna get up, I'm gonna go back to my father and this is what I'm gonna say to him. You can see him like rehearsing in front of the mirror or something. I'm gonna say, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. I love how Jesus is allowing us to enter in to the psychological process that this young man is working through. You see what he's doing is he is, he is bringing himself to a point of self-abasement. I am not worthy, I am this, I am that, I am terrible. I'm not even worthy to be called one of your sons. Make me like one of your hired servants. And this is what the young man figures. If I reduce myself to this worm, 
then perhaps I will somehow be worthy of my father to take me in. Maybe not as a son, but he could take me in as a slave. I might not be able to come back under the same status that I left, but at least maybe he'll allow me to come back as a hired hand. You see the the thought process that's going on? This young man is in for a rude awakening. Because religion will try to tell you that God will never accept you as a son, but maybe he'll accept the work of your hands if you just perform enough for him now. You can make up for the bad things that you've done. The religion will tell you the scale is tilted onto one side, but maybe if I work really hard, I can tilt the scale back again. And it's under this pretense that the prodigal son begins his journey home. And I love to think about how that must have gone because I'm sure that as we've already seen some of the mental process, I'm sure that he was rehearsing over and over and over in his mind how this scene would go. He could already see the stern look that was going to come over his father's face when his father realized he wasted all that money. He could already see the disappointment in his father's eyes. And he rehearsed the speech that he would give him. I'm not worthy to become, I'm not worthy to be your son. Take me as one of your hired servants. I'm a worm, please, I'm so sorry. And he was going over and over and over this in his mind. And probably with each moment that he rehearsed what was going to happen, his feet started to feel a little bit heavier. Finally, the Bible says, Verse, in verse 20, that while he was still a long way off, the father saw him and was filled with compassion. <laughs> I could preach a whole sermon just on that one sentence. While he was still a long way off. Is there anybody who's ever been a long way off before? Can I tell you something? Jesus sees you. And let me tell you what he sees. He's not filled with hate. He's not filled with disappointment. He's not filled with condemnation. He's filled with compassion. That's the father you have. I know some of your fathers were terrible examples of what a father should be. And for some of you, when you think of a father, you think of anger and you think of abuse and you think of temper tantrums and you you think of, of, of neglect and you think of all these terrible things. Can I tell you something? The father I'm talking about is not like that. When he sees you, even when you're a long ways off, his heart is filled with compassion for you. You can do nothing for him. You deserve nothing from him and yet he loves you. And so the Bible says, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion and he ran to his son and he threw his arms around him and kissed him. How's that for toxic masculinity? He threw his arms around his son and he kissed him. And this is the scene that's depicted here in this famous Rembrandt painting. You can see there, The father bending down with open hands to receive the son who's kneeling before him and leaning in to his loving embrace. And look at the father's face. He's not judgmental. He's not angry. He's not bitter. He's not vengeful. He's not looking for retribution. He's full of compassion for the child that he loved. All those things that the prodigal son had worried about, all the scenes that he rehearsed in his mind, the disappointed look on his father's face, the anger, the punishment, the vitriol, all of that turned out to be nothing but a mirage. I wonder how many people there are who are prodigals today because they're worried about what's gonna happen when they try to come back. They're worried about the consequences. They're terrified of the repercussions. And so for them, it seems easier just to stay out in the world and to stay away from the Father's house. But all of those fears, all of those worries are just a mirage. The Father feels none of those feelings. His heart longs for you to come home. If he could say one thing to you this morning, this is what he would say, I miss you. I miss you. My son, my daughter, where are you? I love you. Come home. That was the heart of the father. And it's such a good heart that we find it very hard to even believe. Rembrandt 
If you look there at the bottom of that painting, he depicts the son with a tattered robe and old shoes, one of them so worn that it's falling off of his feet and the other one is about to fall off. The story shows us that these objects are about to be replaced with gifts of love, a new robe, new shoes, a ring for his finger, a welcome home feast. All of that is what is awaiting the son. What's he trying to highlight? He's trying to show you that the father doesn't just reluctantly take his son back. He hugs him and he kisses him and he showers him with gifts like Christmas morning. He kills the fatted calf and throws a party for his son's return. That's the way your father feels about you. Hallelujah. You know, they say that one of the ways you can tell a great piece of art is that you can look at it every day for a year and see something new every time. That's the way this painting is. I mean, there's entire books, scholarly books that have been written about this painting. There's so much depth to every piece of it. I was looking at it and suddenly I I realized something about it that struck me. We always talk about the story of the prodigal son, right? But actually, if you go back and you read the story of Jesus, he doesn't start out by saying there was a certain son. He starts out by saying there was a father. Because you see, the focus of the story of the prodigal son is not actually on the prodigal son. The story is about the extravagant love of the father. That's why it's a good Father's Day message, by the way. And if you look at this painting, the return of the prodigal son, you see that that the son has his back to you. It is actually the face of the father that is in full view. And even the way Rembrandt paints it, everything else is a little bit more dark and distorted and even given a sense of depth being in the background. What rests in the foreground is the face of the father because he is the purpose and the point and the subject of the whole story. Here's what I need you to understand this morning. Your story, your testimony is actually not about you. It's all about him. You know, one one of the things that we teach evangelists to do, like in the boot camp or in our fire camps or wherever, is we teach them how to share their testimony. But here's something, let me just give you a very quick piece of advice on giving your testimony. Some people like to give their testimony and talk about all the bad things they did, almost like it's some sort of a resume for their street cred. When you give your testimony, it's not about how bad you've been. That's not the testimony. The testimony is about how good your father has been. He's the testimony. And maybe you say, well, Daniel, if you knew how horrible my life was, you'd never say that anything good could come about of it. But here's the reality. The worst that your life has been, the more glory your father gets. The one that has sinned much, loves much. At the end of the day, it's not about you, it's all about him. He is the point of the story, and to him goes all the praise and all the glory. Maybe just a couple more things. I could give you observations about this painting all day. Two more things I wanna mention. In Rembrandt's painting, the father and the son, as you can see, they are illuminated against the backdrop of what appears to be an infinite void. Behind them is nothing but darkness that seems to go on forever. That's because that void, that darkness, is what the prodigal son came out of. He was in a world of darkness. He was in a world devoid of light and warmth. And it's a world that so many people find themselves in, even right now, maybe even some of you in this room. You know, many times when I preach the gospel, I talk about hell because hell is a thing. You know that, right? Some people don't believe in hell anymore, but the Bible still teaches it and I still teach it. Jesus taught it, the scriptures teach it, and I teach it too. And the Bible describes hell as a place of separation from God. It it describes hell as a place of darkness and torment And there are some people that have said to me, I don't believe in hell. But the reality is many of those same people that don't believe in hell are in hell while they tell me that they don't believe in it. It's because you don't have to die to go to hell. Some of you are in hell right now. What am I talking about? I'm talking about a place of separation from the presence of God. I'm talking about a place of darkness. I'm talking about a place that is devoid of light and life and the warmth of the embrace of the Father. That's what's hell. And by that definition, most of the world is there right now. 
That's what the prodigal son came out of. He came out of hell. He came out of darkness. John 3.19. John says that this is the verdict. Light came into the world. But people love the darkness instead of the light because their deeds were evil. What does that mean? It means that some people have grown so accustomed to the darkness that they actually enjoy it. In fact, some people have grown so accustomed to the darkness that the light bothers them. You know, when you go out of this building this morning, your your eyes will have adjusted to the lighting in this room. As soon as you step outside into the sun, your eyes are going to hurt. This is the way that it is for the world when they come face to face with the gospel. In fact, some of you right now while I'm talking, you don't like me. And it's not because you and I don't have chemistry. It's because the light of what I'm saying, the light of the gospel is offensive to the darkness of the condition that you live in right now. But here is what the story of the prodigal son is. It's not just some some parable that Jesus told. It is an invitation to all of those dwelling in darkness to come out of the darkness and to step into the light, to come home into the warm embrace of the Father's love. Every prodigal is welcome to come home this morning. I'll give you one more little observation about this painting. I didn't realize this until I did some reading about the painting, but If you look here at the back of the prodigal son, you'll notice that you only see him by the side profile. Here's what many people don't know. The prodigal son is actually a self-portrait of Rembrandt who painted the return of the prodigal son. What is he trying to say? He's trying to say that this is not just a story of something that happened to some Jewish boy 2,000 years ago. The story of the prodigal son is the story of me. And it's actually an invitation for all of you to put your own face there because you see, you were the prodigal son or you are the prodigal son. And and the father of the prodigal son is not just his father. That is a representation of your father that welcomes you to come home. It's an invitation to step into the greatest drama of all time and to become part of the story Wherever you find yourself today, maybe you're in a faraway land. Maybe you're trying to fill your soul with things that don't satisfy. Maybe you're living with the pigs and you're longing for home. I have good news for you. Today is your day. And wouldn't it be amazing if you are a prodigal son or daughter? By the way, this has nothing to do with gender. Because even if you're a woman, you could still be the prodigal son. Wouldn't it be amazing if today on Father's Day, you came home into the embrace of the Father? I feel the heart of God this morning. Because there's some of you, I I feel this prophetically right now, that there are some of you that are away from the Lord because of your father. Or, Or maybe it's not your physical father, but maybe it's a, a father figure or a male role model in your life that was so toxic that it drove you away not only from a good life, but it drove you away from the Lord. And ever since then, maybe you have associated God with what you knew in that male father figure or that male role model. Can I tell you something? It's time for you to be reunited with your heavenly father this morning and to be reconciled with him. He is not that, he's good. What about this story reminds you of that man that abused you? This is not that man, this is a good man and he loves you and he would do anything for you. In fact, let me tell you what he did. Romans chapter eight, verse 32. God, who gave his own son, delivered him up for us all and didn't spare him, how much more will he not also with him give us all things? That's the message of the gospel. It's God loves you so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him would not perish 
but have everlasting life. That's the offer. Would you stand with me this morning? Thank you, Jesus. Wow. I feel the heart of the Father this morning. I hope you can feel it too. Even if it's making your eyes hurt a little. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to ask you this. If you are that prodigal, and you see Daniel this morning on Father's Day, 2023, I want to come home. I want to come back into the warm embrace of my Heavenly Father. I want to stop running. I want to come out of the pig pen. I want to put down the pods that the pigs are eating. And I want to step up and sit down at the table of the Lord. I want to be part of his family. I want to be reconciled to him. If that's your desire, I want to pray with you. Wherever you, wherever you are, just lift your hand so I can see. Don't, don't be embarrassed. There's nothing embarrassing about this at all. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So many, so many hands are going up. Here's what I want you to do. For those of you that lifted your hand, I want to pray with you. And, and I want this to be a landmark day for you. I don't want you to ever forget what's going to happen right now. This day, Father's Day, 2023, is going to be a day that you look back on years to come. And you say, that was the day that I was reconciled to my father. For some of you, this will be the last thing you think about on your deathbed one day. You'll say, I'm so glad that I came back to my father's house. If, that, if you lifted your hand and you said, I want to pray that prayer, I want to come back, I want you to get out of your seat and just come and just stand here in this altar area. You're welcome. <laughs> altar team, come. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The Lord just spoke to me and said, there's a dad that needs to come back to his father. Because <laughs> even fathers have fathers. Here's what I want you to do in just a moment. I'm going to ask every person to turn to the one on their right and their left, and you're going to ask them a simple question. Say, do you need to be down there? at that altar, and if they say yes, take them by the hand and bring them. Do it right now. Turn to the one on your right and your left. Say, do you need to be down at that altar? If they say yes, say, I'll go with you. Take them by the hand and bring them with you. Come on, come on. You are so welcome. Man. Can you imagine a better Father's Day? Wow, somebody said, what do you want for Father's Day? Man, this is it. People coming back to their Heavenly Father, it doesn't get any better than this. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, those of, you, those of you that are in the altars, listen to me now, okay? Here's what's about to happen. We're gonna pray together. This is not a religious formality. This is not a prayer that's coming out of some prayer book. It's not even in the Bible. I'm gonna make it up off the top of my head. And you said, maybe you say, why should we pray a prayer that you're making up? It's because it's not about the words. It's about the heart. The Bible says that if you will call upon the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. So all that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to try to help you to put words to the cry of your heart. But remember, it's not the words that save you. It is the cry of the heart. So. I'm gonna ask you to repeat after me and I'm actually gonna ask everyone in this room to pray after me in support of the ones that are praying for the first time. And here's what's going to happen is that as you pray this, a miracle is gonna happen. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. This is not about joining a church. This is not about giving mental assent to some statement of doctrine. This is not about going through religious formalities. This is about a miracle that's about to take place, a heart transplant. I, I was thinking, you know, probably a couple years now, I was just meditating on that verse. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. 
old things have passed away, all things become new. And I thought, Lord, that can't be true. I thought, well, when a person gets saved, they don't have a new house. I said, all things become new. Same house, same car, same spouse, same body. It's like, what is new exactly? How can it say everything has become new? And then I realized that if you become new and the person looking out is new, and you're looking at the world with new eyes, suddenly everything has become new. So maybe you're, maybe you're a husband and you're saying, man, I really wish I could have a new wife. Well, let me tell you what you do. You get born again, look at your wife with new eyes and you'll be surprised how amazing she is. I remember when Steve Hill used to tell his testimony, he would say that after he got saved, he walked outside and he said, oh my goodness, the grass is so green. The sky is so blue. Can I tell you something? The grass did not get greener, but he got saved and that made all the difference. So that's what's gonna happen right now. Are you guys ready? We're gonna pray and we're gonna pray in faith and Jesus is gonna answer us. Are you ready? Come on, say, dear Lord Jesus Christ, I come to you today a sinner needing salvation. Lord Jesus Christ, son of David, have mercy on me. Save me now. Be my savior. Be my Lord. Be my very best friend. Lord, I humble myself. Take my heart. Make me a new creation. I now confess with my mouth what I believe in my heart, that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he died on the cross for me, that he rose from the dead for me. He is the King of Kings and he is the Lord of my life. And from this moment on, I belong to Jesus and he belongs to me. I believe it, I receive it and I confess it in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen, amen. I'm asking all of the, the counselors to begin to work right now. For those of you that came forward, please do not leave until these counselors have had a chance to speak with you. For the rest, we're gonna worship together. And let me just one more time say to all of the fathers, have an amazing Father's Day. Your heavenly Father loves you very much. And we'll see you again next week.